Leave anything for us? For us? For us? A good supply of body bags. Body bags. Body bags. And welcome back to the Movie Morgue, where we fill out toe tags for cinema's body bags. I'm Josh, your movie examiner, and today we're closing out the Terminator franchise with Terminator Dark Fate, released in 2019 and directed by Tim Miller. Real quick, got some test results here, and it looks like 91% of you guys watching are not subscribed to the channel. So make sure you do that, and we'll check back next video to see where we're at, okay? Terminator Genesis was planned to launch a new trilogy, leaving questions yet to be answered and ending with a soft cliffhanger in a mid credit scene. Hey, who sent you back? Those files have been erased. Oh, that's convenient. However, due to a disappointing box office, Skydance went back to the drawing board and left Genesis off in its own little timeline. Oh, great. That's just great. After the success of 2018's Halloween, a quote-unquote legacy sequel that begins where the original left off, bringing back Laurie Strode to do her best Sarah Connor impression, and disregards all the cannon fodder of previous sequels. Wasn't it her brother who, like, cold-blooded murdered all those teenagers? No. Trick or treat, motherfucker. That's just a bit that some people made up to make him feel better, I think. Skydance decided to follow suit with Dark Fate and terminated all previous iterations of John Connor from Rise of the Machines to Genesis. Aw, I'm sure gonna miss Jai Courtney. Because he's a killer! Director Tim Miller was just coming off of the success of Deadpool. I'm touching myself tonight. But due to disagreements, left the sequel for the opportunity of a lifetime to work on a Terminator film. I was standing there looking at a monitor, and on one camera was Linda Hamilton, and on another camera was Arnold Schwarzenegger. I thought, holy fuck, I'm making a Terminator movie. Miller was instrumental in changing the direction of the story. But in order to make way for this new future, you kind of have to be done with John. And I think it really slaps the audience in the face and says, wake up, there's something new about to happen. And in bringing back Jim Cameron to the franchise. I worked with Tim Miller, trying to give him the best bat to hit a home run off of. And of course, Cameron's good buddy Arnold was back on board, but they would also bring back the legendary Linda Hamilton to portray Sarah Connor. Time travel movies are tricky, right? They can be a real mind fuck. So the central premise that we operate from is Judgment Day is inevitable. It carries on the, the true story that we started telling in 1984. It's just very focused on the characters, and it's just a fast white knuckle ride. Terminator Dark Fate picks up three years after the events of Terminator 2. The Connors are enjoying their new lives until a T-800 shows up, and it's not Uncle Bob. 22 years later, an augmented human named Grace is sent to present-day Mexico. Never seen one like you before. Almost human. I am human. Just enhanced. To protect Danny Ramos, future leader of the Resistance and the newest hope for mankind, from a deadly new Terminator with a split personality. It's a Rev-9 model. You don't fight it, you run from it. And gets a little bit of help from a seasoned professional. My name is Sarah Connor. Who tags along for the ride. I hunt Terminators. Why do you care what happens to her? Because I was her and it sucks. The trio cross the border into Texas in search of a mysterious ally, a retired T-800 that Sarah knows all too well and he aids them in their mission to protect Danny from the Rev-9 to ensure the survival of mankind once again. A Terminator has just killed your whole family. What do you do? I want to stand and fight. Which results in a face-off with the murder bot by land, by air, and by sea, before they set up a kill box in hopes of destroying the indestructible cyborg. This is our kill box. Once and for all. You saved me. Let me save you. <gasps> But how many people met their dark fate in the current last installment of the Terminator franchise? Go ahead and drop your guess in the comments below while I bag them and tag them. I'll order up some body bags. We open with a trip down memory lane with archive footage of Sarah from Terminator 2 reminding us to wear sunblock. Anybody not wearing two million sunblock is gonna have a real bad day, get it? Because we're going to Skull Beach, where Skynet is on spring break. Spring break. Murder skeletons and HKs are clearing the beach of any human tourist. One murder skeleton finds a young girl and says, Look, Look at my, my shit. shit. Machine guns. But Sarah tells us that future never happened. Because I stopped it. Okay, well, never mind. We then go to 1998 Guatemala, where the Connors are on vacation after the events of T2, but unbeknownst to them, Skynet sent multiple T-800s back to kill John. Hasta la vista. 
The de-aging visual effects in this scene are amazing and were very difficult to pull it's off. It's unbelievably difficult. ILM is working with a process where they're doing some facial tracking that they can actually apply to their models. And they're really pushing the boundaries to try to make that look as photoreal and believable for the audience as possible. And I feel like we've, we've taken a leap on this one. It looks great. And John Connor is finally terminated. And it only took five movies to do it. Yeah. Major drag, huh? The cyborg goes for a margarita as Sarah holds her lifeless son in her arms. It kind of feels like when Newt dies in Alien 3. We then fast forward 22 years to Mexico City, where a couple witnessed the arrival of Grace, our new version of Kyle Reese. They check her vitals and walk her to their car, but bad news, the policia have arrived. And they never miss a chance to see it rain naked ladies. See, I told you. She finally reboots and is like, fuck the police. Fuck the police. Fuck, fuck, fuck the police. And she proceeds to make pork chops out of the cops. Cop chops. Now, if any of you sons of bitches got anything else to say, now's the fucking time. Hey, thanks for saving our asses there, lady. Don't thank me yet. She speeds off with their car and his outfit. Let's meet our new target, Danny Ramos, played by Natalia Reyes. Her brother, Diego, who wants to be the next Bruno Mars, good boy Taco, and Poppy Ramos. She leaves Poppy breakfast and then drags Diego off to work. They clock in only to find that their positions have been terminated and they've been replaced by machines from the future. Danny pulls her hair down and goes to give the boss man a healthy dose of foreshadowing. What happens if I tell them they're just keeping a spot warm for some machine? Mr. Reyes shows up a little confused. Uh, my kids forgot their lunches. That's it, lunches. Meanwhile, Grace clocks out the security guard and takes his shift for the day and borrows his shotgun. Mr. Ramos spots Danny, but before he can give her her lunch, Grace gives him a bullet. Oh. <laughs> then unloads on him and Danny's like, what the fuck is going on right now? Grace tells them that's not their father, but a Rev-9 Terminator. He arrived earlier that day and visited their apartment. And unfortunately, I'll have to give Poppy Ramos a toe tag. I hope Taco's okay. And he was just about to give Danny a bullet sandwich before Grace stepped in and gave Danny her best pickup line. You come with me or you're dead in the next 30 seconds. What a charmer. Works every time. Michael Scott parkours through the facility after them. Extreme! Parkour! Parkour! But Grace is like... Stop! Hammer time! And goes all cannibal corpse on his face. Hammer smashed face! The Rev-9 is played by Gabrielle Luna, who played Robbie Reyes, aka Ghost Rider on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and is alive and thriving in another post-apocalyptic world in HBO's The Last of Us. Grace manages to get the drop on the Rev-9 with some help from Diego and introduces herself. Grace! My name is Grace. It says, we gotta keep moving, keep it moving, keep it moving. She fills them in on her mission as they steal a truck and speed away, but before she can finish, the Rev-9 comes through the wall and our high-speed chase begins. Which honestly is pretty damn awesome and was mostly shot in camera with only CGI flourishes. That's the bulk of the visual effects work, but the fundamentals, it's all rooted in camera. The roots of Terminator is in practical effects, and I didn't know as much about practical effects, so we, we brought in a lot of experts, like Graham Kelly, who was our action vehicles guy. There are some great stunts with reverse driving and cars being plowed from the interstate. One of the stunt drivers here was even brought back from Terminator 2's Freightliner chase. Some of the car crashes here are pretty brutal, but since I don't see any bodies, I'm not filling out any toe tags. Grace hops in the back of the truck and Diego takes the wheel. She takes aim and throws some rebar at the Rev-9, and we watch the liquid metal separate from the endoskeleton, giving us two Terminators for the price of one. Grace manages to roll the dump truck, but he says, you're not going anywhere without me. And Grace uses every tool at her disposal to remove him from the vehicle. And he's flattened on the highway. And you're outy here. Get it? Audi? Grace takes flight as Diego crashes into a guardrail. Are you okay, Diego? Estoy bien. I don't think you are, muchacho, but I'm no doctor. Don't! He will bleed out. The Rev-9 squirms into a car and then runs over a human speed bump after them. He should have got outy away. Get it? Diego tells Grace to take Danny and go. She apologizes, then pulls Danny aside, just as the Rev-9 uptown funks Diego up. Don't believe me? Just watch. 
Sorry, Diego. There's only room for one Bruno Mars in this timeline. Say what? Hope you're not locked out of heaven. And the choice to make the Liquid Terminator matte black is just... Ah. It's just this evolved hybrid of the T-800 and the T-1000 matte black alloy endoskeleton with a, a Mercurius liquid exoskeleton that can operate remotely from the central CPU. Two machines converge on the girls, and Grace tells Danny, They start to kill me. Run. What? But before they do, someone comes to the rescue. Who the fuck is that? Yeah, who the fuck is that? Who the fuck is that? That's the one and only Sarah motherfucking Connor, Terminator Hunter. It's really interesting to go back into our story and Sarah has lived through events that are from a future that never happened because she changed it at the end of Terminator 2. It was hard to figure out where Sarah Connor is now. Who is she now? Is she a complete lunatic? When Sarah comes into the movie, you just feel this amazing sense of, okay, here we go. She's back, she's bad. She sings Rocket Man to the endoskeleton, drops a bomb on the remote unit, and has the cojones to steal Arnold's tagline. I'll be back. And if you didn't notice, the gun she's using is the gun the Terminator used to kill John. Grace is like, we're not sticking around for the after party and steal Sarah's truck. Goddamn Gen Z, no respect for other people's property. What are you looking at? You got a problem? This guy acts like he's never seen a Terminator before. Let's go get an oil change, what do you say? Grace gives Danny the bad news about her father before her blood sugar plummets and she dozes off at the wheel. She tells Danny she was dialed in for short controlled burst because you either kill a Rev-9 in the first few minutes or you're dead. She spent all of her energy fighting the Rev-9 and needs meds. And then she dozes off behind the wheel. Danny decides to go to the police for help, but Grace changes her mind after telling her a joke. Hey, you know what you get when you put a hundred cops between you and a Terminator? No, what, Grace? You'll get a hundred dead cops. Eh, <laughs> uh, just stick with being a super soldier, Grace. Leave the jokes to me, okay? They stop at a pharmacy to get a prescription filled. Here's my prescription. But Grace collapses as their Uber driver, Sarah Connor, arrives. She tries to make small talk with Danny and ask her who she is. Who are you? <laughs> Nobody. Well, they don't send super soldiers from the future to protect just nobody. And Sarah informs her that this is a no cell phone zone. ¿Qué pasa, güera? They check into the Bates Motel and put Grace on ice. We should have done this in the bathtub. But Sarah's like, you'd have to be psycho to get in that bathtub. <laughs> Sarah tells Danny she's wanted in a few states. Dipty, actually. Apparently for ripping off a Frito-Lay's truck. What's up with that? Because I really like potato chips. Yeah, but more like Frito-Lay's got in on that product placement. The chip bags are a good place to stash her cell phone to block anyone from tracking her. Sarah pumps Grace full of meds while Danny grieves her losses. And Grace has a dream full of exposition so we get a glimpse at the future she comes from. Here we go with the Game of Thrones actors again. Is that Rick on or Dick on? Dick on. <laughs> Dick on. You can also see Tom Hopper in the Umbrella Academy on Netflix. Her team was ambushed while transporting their injured commander to base. We're inside what I've been told is called the Dragonfly, and um, it's a helicopter from the future, and it's hard to say what it's gonna look like, because it's all blue screen right now, but God, I can't wait to see it. Rev-7s rain down on the Dragonfly, and I see three that I'm considering dead in this overhead shot, because some of these guys are still alive. But not for long. The Rev-7s are one of my favorite iterations of a Terminator. I love the way they split apart and the tentacles are amazing. The Rev-7s are seven foot tall, liquid metal and endoskeleton combined. Once you sort of decide on, we're gonna do the endoskeleton with liquid metal over top of it, then that kind of becomes the technological basis for everything Legion does in the future. So everything is that. And so I thought, how is it gonna kill people? It's gonna make these tentacles and fucking stab them to death. Grace is injured by the liquid half of a Rev-7 and watches as more of her team are ripped to shreds. We see a total of 11 soldiers impaled, ripped apart, and tossed aside in the assault. She fires at a charging Rev-7 and then is magically whisked away to her base. Having been severely wounded, Grace volunteers as tribute to be made an augmented super soldier. And we see flashes of her going under the knife to get her energizer installed. But she awakes to a gun in her face. Talk fast. Yeah, you first, Grandma. The two ladies get acquainted, and Grace gets offended when Sarah says she could pass for a human. I am human. But she's no replicant. 
She's just enhanced with increased speed and super strength. Which means I can rip your throat out if you piss me off, so don't. I wonder if she's related to Dalton. Grace is played by Mackenzie Davis. She's a pretty interesting character. Mackenzie, she's a fantastic actor. She has a lot of humanity. You instantly like her. She came from another futuristic film, Blade Runner 2049, and played Cameron on the short-lived Halt and Catch Fire on AMC. She was also in the excellent Black Mirror episode, San Junipero, and informed Sarah that she's from the year 2042. Your turn. Sarah introduces herself and then tells them the story of Skynet. You're a terminated fucker. <laughs> Grace is like, what the fuck is a Skynet? I've never heard of it. She gives the girls a history lesson and explains Skynet sent many Terminators after her son, John. One finally found him and carried out orders from a future that never happened. Since then, she hunts Terminators. And I drink till they black out. And that's not a good enough resume for Grace. She's willing to take their chances without Sarah. Sarah says, good luck. With modern technology, you might last 10 hours. Grace begrudgingly takes her up on her offer, but warns Sarah, if anything happens, I will fuck you up. Right. They hit the road and Grace tells the girls about Legion. And it wasn't some Skynet thing. And that you don't kill a Rev-9. You run from it. Danny asks Sarah how she knew they'd be on the bridge. And she tells them that someone has slid into her DMs and has been sending her GPS coordinates <laughs> with the sign off for John. When she gets to the location, a Terminator shows up and she terminates it. And Grace does some future shit to Sarah's phone to pinpoint exactly where the texts are coming from, then shows them her sweet new tat she got before she left 2042. With the exact same coordinates out of Laredo. So what does that mean? It means we're going to Texas. The stars at night are big and bright. Big in the heart of Texas. <laughs> They ditch their car and hop on a train, destination USA. Meanwhile, the Rev-9 has infiltrated the Rathium data center and padded out the body count for us, leaving two dead security guards while he hacks into camera feeds and locates his target. On the train ride, Grace gives us her backstory, telling us about her judgment day. There's no warning. And by day three, the whole world was at war. Millions died. And she had it pretty rough, but wouldn't have made it as long as she did if someone hadn't helped her. Sarah jumps to the conclusion that Danny's son will be the new savior, which is fine with her. Someone else can be Mother Mary for a change. If you're Mother Mary, why do I so want to beat the shit out of you? Danny visits her uncle Felipe for help getting into Texas. Gringas are not my usual clientele. And it only takes some fancy knife work from Grace to convince him to help smuggle them across. In deleted scenes, Felipe escorts the girls, but they are attacked by Border Patrol. Grace takes a few of them out, and Felipe is killed before they cross the border. But since these scenes were deleted, no toe tags. Meanwhile at the border, a patrol officer gets the third degree for not bringing snacks. And neglects to bring us donuts. Terrence, shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, get your own donuts, Terrence. Here's a toe tag for you. Here's a toe tag for you, and one for the young lady he copied. And two more for the other technicians. He takes control of a drone and locates the trio, and orders the border patrol to shoot on sight. Grace spots the drone as they reach the border, but Sarah can't see or hear anything. Yeah, well, you're not an augmented super soldier from the future, are you? But as soon as they cross, Grace has an oh shit moment. Stop! The border patrol apprehends them, but that drone is still above their heads and it's coming down fast. Grace shoves Danny out of the blast zone as it decimates a vehicle. Hit the deck! I see two unresponsive bodies after the explosion, so I'm gonna go ahead and get them body bags. At the Border Patrol Detainment Center, Danny tells a guard that machines are after them, and everyone here is in danger, including her. You're in danger too. No, I'm in processing. And even though this was shot in an old Nokia factory, Tim Miller still felt the need to apologize to the cast and crew because it felt so authentic. Tim Miller, our director, was crying, but he was just asking everyone to forgive him for all this, you know, like suffering we're just like recreating here. I got on the PA system and apologized because it was hard being there. Likewise, I believe these people, the Border Patrol, doing their job. It doesn't vilify anybody. It just shines a light on a situation that is unfortunate for all concerned. So it was very emotionally powerful. All the actors felt it when we were there. The Rev-9 arrives and bluffs his way through security. Metal hip. Two tours in Afghanistan. While America's Most Wanted gets escorted to her private room, and Grace has been taken for medical attention, and the doctors have no clue what they're looking at. 
She awakens and is pissed because she did not consent to this. Did I say you could look at my private parts? She pumps herself up, sets off a fire alarm, and opens the containment gates and finds Danny. They make their way out of the facility as the Rev-9 is slowed down by the escaping detainees, and I'll go ahead and give this one a toe tag. The distraction also gives Sarah an opportunity to get herself out of handcuffs and borrow this agent's gun. The Rev-9 hops around like Toad from X-Men and kicks off a murder montage. And the guard that should have listened to Danny is the first to be processed. We'll go ahead and cross two and three off while he impales number four. Number five gets a blade to the face. And number six gets one to the ribs. He does a sweet spin move into a scissor slice, then skewers two more officers. And then it turns into a dog pile. And he turns himself into a porcupine, penetrating all the officers. He finishes off the last of the guards, and I have a total of 18 that he ran through. Grace and Danny's chariot awaits, but Danny isn't going anywhere without Sarah. Danny holds off the running man, giving Sarah time to hop aboard, and they leave the Rev-9 behind. Hey, that rhymed. And the guy on the ground here is not dead. Grace just knocked him out, in case you were wondering. Grace tells Danny, you can't do stupid shit like that, because you're too damn important. And Sarah recalls an exchange with her deceased son. You cannot risk yourself even for me. Do you understand? You're too important and agrees with Grace. She's right. They arrive at their destination and knock knock on the mystery texter's door. Sarah is shocked when all of her trauma comes walking out and I'm just like. You need to calm down. You're being too loud. The Terminator serves up some cervezas and Sarah gets a little cheeky with the robot about his family photos. Is she a Terminator too? That's your little Terminator kid? His name is Mateo. The Terminator had no more purpose after killing John and found Alicia and Mateo, products of an abusive relationship, and over time became self-aware. You grew a conscience? The equivalent to one, yes. After raising Mateo as his own, he's felt remorse for taking John from Sarah. So when he detects the arrival of new Terminators, he sends Sarah the location to give meaning to John's death. But she pops a few caps in his ass. All right, you're good? You got it all out of your system now? I'm going to help you protect the girl because I choose to. His family arrives and he's like, call me Carl. My family doesn't know I'm a cyborg. I'm never gonna fucking call you Carl. She hasn't noticed that you weigh 400 pounds. No. But their relationship isn't physical. They just know he's dependable, a good listener. And I'm extremely funny. So back to the problem at hand. How do we stop this thing? We set up a kill box. A what? Kill box. What the fuck is a kill box? Grace doesn't like the idea of using Danny as bait, but she's like, I don't really care what you like. I want to stand and fight. We're gonna set up a kill box. Kill box. Okay, I think they just like saying kill box. And Carl just can't contain his excitement. This plan has a high probability of success. And shows them that he's been preparing for the end of the world. Also, this is Texas. Okay, you've got a point there. They let Danny kill some watermelons. But they don't get toe tags. Target practice is good and all, but Grace says these weapons aren't going to do shit to a Rev-9 and suggests an EMP at close range should do the trick. And Sarah's like, hey, I know a guy that could hook us up with that. Air Force Intelligence Officer out of Bingham. You've been spying on me, Chrome Dome? Keep your phone in a bag of potato chips. The family says their goodbyes to Carl, and he sends them away, stating his past has caught up to him. I won't be back. Danny thanks him for his sacrifice. Sarah promises him that when this is all over, she's gonna terminate his ass. Touche. Carl grabs his signature shades, but he's not the Terminator he used to be. So he leaves him behind and they speed away. Carl entertains the girls with a story about his work day. He wanted to have solid colored drapes in a little girl's room. I said, don't do it. Drapes, really? Drapes? This was the perfect opportunity to make him an exterminator. Hello? Officer Dean delivers Sarah's birthday present and says, only for you do I do this, Connor. But the Rev-9 crashes the party. Dean takes a bullet, but doesn't get a toe tag. The remote unit gives chase until Carl wrecks his shit and sends the chopper into a tailspin. <laughs> Officer Dean conveniently leads them to his airfield and lets them aboard a cargo plane and tells them he's gonna give them as much cover as he can. 
Grace mans the plane as the Rev-9 catches up in the helicopter, only to get decimated. He then leaps aboard, only to get a face full of bullets and a ride back down to ground level. You stay out of trouble down there, young man. Take care. I hope you die, you bastard. Bye-bye. Come on by the Texas Roadhouse. Every Friday, it's rain and men. Sorry about your shit. We have a problem. Their EMP was destroyed in the action, and now they have to move to plan B. I estimate our chances at 12%. But Danny is a glass half full kind of girl. That's not zero. Grace starts to give her the future depends on you speech, and Danny shuts that shit down. I don't give a you shit it... about the future. See, Danny is in fact the person that found her in the ruins of Judgment Day. And she's not the mother of someone that will save the future. And Sarah realizes Danny is the new John Connor. She's John. You are the future. The Rev-9 shows up right on cue, and we see two dead pilots as he gets a little too close to this jet and kills this pilot. He then rubs up against our team's plane and sets off a killer set piece, full of destruction and variable G fighting that is a visual effects spectacle. Everybody really wanted to do a scene in the plane where we had this big fight going on and gravity with variable G. This allows us to have this sort of really complicated mind fuck of a fight inside that. And it was by far the hardest thing to choreograph and figure out. Level. There is a weightlessness and a auto correction that happens, which is going to play out throughout the sequence. There's just a huge mix of live action and digi doubles and. There's a huge amount of VFX. And so the process is Julian and Tim will sit down and they'll cut the sequence. And then they'll come to me and they'll say, OK, well, these are the VFX that we need to enhance this and bring our vision out. So, forth. And so there's a massive amount of work within that, but hopefully it goes unnoticed. Carl pins the Rev-9 down, then borrows his grenade launcher and blasts the cargo door so Grace can get the Hummer with Danny and Sarah out of it. The remote unit is like, peace. But Carl says, you're not going anywhere, buddy. The Hummer plummets down to Earth, and Mackenzie Davis looks like she had a blast shooting this sequence. It's going to be a tiring couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> we are um, shooting a scene on wires outside of a Humvee where I'm holding onto it as it plummets down to Earth. It's very fun to swing about up there and, and a little painful. The plane goes down with Carl and the endoskeleton still aboard and barely misses the Hummer on its descent. It lands in a river that leads to a hydroelectric dam and culminates into an underwater fight that is also very impressive visual effects wise. And those were really fun because Tim wanted to play it very murky and very dark and yet these eyes punctuate out of the darkness and it's very creepy and I think it elicits everything that the original Terminator film did in terms of who these characters are. And the Rev-9 pulls it together and heads after Danny. The Hummer crash lands on the dam, but the parachute sends it over the side and it's only being held by the straps. With the Rev-9 closing in, lifeguard Grace says make sure your seatbelts are fastened and keep your hands and feet in the ride at all times. Oh no, Grace, really? Stop it! Linda Hamilton did not have a good time filming the Hummer sequence. They hang you upside down, you feel nauseated. Linda's having so much fun. Jump on in. <laughs> Come in. So much fun. Grace slices the strap and sends the Hummer down the world's biggest water slide as she gets tangled up with the Rev-9. You have this big underwater sequence where the Humvee is tumbling, being washed down the river while this Terminator is coming after them to kill him. It's pretty fucking cool. Sarah and Danny fend off the murder bot with a parachute to the face, then make their way to the surface to meet up with Grace. Hey, that rhymed. With her health being depleted going into the final boss fight, she tells them to use her power source to destroy the Rev-9. But Carl slides in and saves the day. I'm back. You look terrible. At least I still have on my face. He gives Grace a power up as the final boss arrives and the crew choose their weapons and prepare for a showdown. Choose your weapon. This is our kill box. The Rev-9 arrives and demands they hand over Danny, but they refuse and then he tries the Bobby Newport approach. Come on, give me it. Give me it. Give me it. Come on, give me it. I'm sorry. Please. Please. Because we're not machines, you metal motherfucker. Carl kind of is and Grace half is, but I, I, knew, I knew what you were saying. The boss fight begins and Carl goes at him like Thor with Molnir. 
This fight scene was pre-shot with stunt actors that matched all the choreography of the fight. And there'll be a lot of people wearing interesting hats running around because of the nature of some of our stunts. We have to take our heroes and basically replace our stunt players. So we're putting other people's heads on other people's bodies in order to pull that off. And Grace goes Ghost Rider on Robbie Reyes with her hook and chain. All she needs now is a flaming skull. He impales Grace and then goes for Danny, but Sarah shows him her shotgun skills and he splits himself in two. And it's really cool to see how these previs shots match up perfectly with the final product. When you do the stunts and you do all this action stuff, you never really know what it's going to end up looking like. Carl pounds the endoskeleton and gives him a lift to the second floor, while Grace slices up the liquid guy like this were a game of fruit ninja. Grace fights with this chain that she's spinning really fast, and she's using it in a way that I think is pretty cool. I'm Micah Carnes. I'm the assistant fight coordinator, and right now I'm doing motion capture for the endoskeleton. There's a bunch of trackers on the suit, and then somewhere in post, VFX guys do their thing. And on the day, you'll see that it's an endoskeleton. They converge on Carl, and then Grace lassos herself a pair of Terminators. Carl tackles him, then Grace puts the reins on him. Just in terms of the damage to Gabriel, in order to create the effect, we actually just replaced the lower jaw. But we kept the eyes and nose and all the places where he was giving us this like really amazing performance. They managed to shove him into a turbine. You spin me right round, baby, right round, like a Terminator, right round, round, round. Danny finds Grace in the debris, and she's not in good shape. Grace tells Danny to take her Energizer and use it. Sarah Sarah finds Carl taking a nap and then gets distracted by a bump in the night. Peekaboo! This is a Terminator movie after all. And the endoskeleton rises, looking like Tar Man from Return of the Living Dead. So she cuts into Grace, reaches into her torso, and apologizes as she pulls Grace's battery out. I'm sorry. <laughs> and Grace breathes her last words. I and I'll go ahead and fill out her toe tag. Danny calls out the murder skeleton, then unloads on him. I'm gonna kill you, fucker. Literally and figuratively. Before she lands the deadly blow, it knocks the power cell from her hands. Sarah yells at the T-800. Nope, not until you call me by my name. Call! Call! Ah, wake up! I'm awake. He gives Danny enough time to jab that fucker right in the eye. Ah! Carl drags it over the edge and then has a Gandalf the Grey moment. Die, you fools. Ah! He holds the incredible melting machine down and says, Good job. Sarah looks down and makes peace with Carl, and Danny finds Grace's lifeless body and tells her they got him. Sometime later, Danny watches over a young Grace. Then she and Sarah hit the road, and she declares she won't let Grace die for her again. Then you need to be ready. And the young Grace watches as the two drive away into the future, and credits roll. So, how many bodies did we collect in Terminator Dark Fate? Let's get out the blackboard and break it down. We've got a total of 47 body bags that we collected in Terminator Dark Fate. I could only identify four of the victims, which means we had 43 John slash Jane Doe's. And with a runtime of 128 minutes, that left us sending out the meat wagon every 2.6 minutes. Now I'll have to give the toe tag for best cause of death to the detention center massacre. There's just something poetic about an actor of Mexican descent ripping the border patrol to shreds. Now I'll have to give an honorable mention toe tag to the Rev 7 massacre. The Rev 7s are just an awesome version of the Terminator, and I love watching them decimate all of these soldiers. And that concludes my exam of Terminator Dark Fate and our look at the Terminator franchise. Dark Fate had been planned again as a new trilogy, but after disappointing box office numbers, you know what happened. Speculation of James Cameron developing a script for a reboot have popped up here and there, but Linda Hamilton has been quite vocal about not returning stating she's done with the character. While Dark Fate failed to impress at the box office, I personally think it's one of the better entries in the franchise, and have way more interest in a character like Grace than retreading the same waters over and over again. Schwarzenegger is no longer a necessity in my opinion, and the franchise is struggling from the same hangup Star Wars had holding on to the Skywalker family. That's impossible! It's time to let it go, guys. Cameron built a vast universe with the first Terminator film, 
and the only one to slightly explore it was Salvation, which no one got on board with, so what the fuck do I know? But if another Terminator movie comes along, you bet your ass I'll be back for it. I'm back. It's been super fun to deep dive into all of these movies, and I love everything that I've learned along the way. I've been Josh, your movie examiner, and I'll be back next time to examine Seven, starring Morgan Freeman, Brad Pitt, and directed by David Fincher. Thanks for liking, commenting, and subscribing, and make sure you hit the notification bell so you can join me next time I fill out toe tags for Cinema's Body Bags. Until then, enjoy being alive. That's it guys, we're done with the Terminator franchise, finally. It's been so fun to talk about these movies with everybody though, and I love the comments I've been getting on the show. I love that you guys are liking the videos and watching the videos. Please continue to hit that subscribe button and smash that like button for me. It definitely helps me out. Thank you so much again to my buddy Nathan for helping out with everything. Coming back next week with Seven. I love David Fincher. I'm so excited to talk about this movie and see what you guys think about that episode. Going to be doing a couple of little one-offs here and there. I've got Drive from Nicholas Winding Refn coming up. And then I'm going to be doing Sisu, which came out last year. So stick around for that. And then we'll be moving into another franchise shortly after that. And uh, it's pretty mad. That's all I'll say. It's mad. Thanks again for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time.